Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I would like to thank you for joining us for today's program entitled Whistler Cities, Our Cities, which was inspired by the exhibition currently on view at the Colby College Museum of Art, Whistler, Streetscapes, Urban Change, which will soon open in a new iteration at the National Museum of Asian Art in Washington, D.C. later this fall in November. My name is Elisa Herman, and I serve as a Lunder Curator of Works on Paper and Whistler Studies at the Colby College Museum of Art. Before beginning today's program, I would like to acknowledge that our speakers in Maine are situated in the homeland of the Wabanaki people, and our speakers in Washington, D.C. are situated in the traditional territory of the Nakachank and Piscataway communities. We express our respect to the indigenous communities who have lived on these ancestral lands for almost 15,000 years and their future generations. Co-sponsored by the Colby College Museum of Art and the National Museum of Asian Art, today's program will consider both historical and contemporary perspectives on land, community, and the built environment as central to our discussion of Whistler's depictions of the urban landscape in the context of emergent contemporary issues facing the two cities hosting the exhibition, Waterville, Maine, and Washington, D.C. The exhibition, which features paintings, prints, and drawings by James McNeil Whistler that capture the rapid transformation of European cities such as Paris, London, and Amsterdam during the Victorian era, reflects upon the artistic translation of the uncertainties surrounding urban life at the time. But today's program aims to expand upon this discourse by further exploring what parallels exist between Whistler's times and the present day. What lessons have or have not been learned about contemporary cities that have undergone similar campaigns of urban renewal, industrialization, and commercial growth? Before we begin today's conversation, it is my pleasure to introduce the four panelists joining us today. First is the guest curator of this exhibition, David Park Curry. David is an independent scholar who served as a 2020-2021 senior fellow at the Colby Museum's Lunder Institute for American Art. He holds a PhD in the history of art from Yale University, and his work as a curator has included key roles at the Freer Gallery of Art, the Denver Art Museum, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, and the Baltimore Museum of Art. Curry is the author of James McNeil Whistler at the Freer Gallery of Art, published in 1984, and a monograph entitled James McNeil Whistler, Uneasy Pieces, published in 2004 following his 2003 Freer exhibition, Mr. Whistler's Galleries. Our second panelist is Benjamin Lyle, an assistant curate, an assistant, an assistant professor of American Studies at Colby College, whose work examines urban geography and cultural history in the United States after World War II. In 2017, Ben authored the book Modern Coliseum: Stadiums in American Culture, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press. Our third panelist is Scott Kratz, who is the senior vice president of the nonprofit organization Building Bridges Across the River and also serves as the director of the 11th Street Bridge Park in Washington, DC. For the last 10 years, Scott has been working with the East of the River-based uh, nonprofit and local city government to transform an old freeway bridge into a park above the Anacostia River. Scott leads the team that is designing, building, and will one day operate the park. Our fourth panelist is Diana Greenwald, who serves as the Lunder Curator of American Art at the National Museum of Asian Art, and is co-curating the new iteration of the exhibition with David. Diana specializes in late 19th and early 20th century American fine and decorative arts. From 2014 to 2021, Diana served in various curatorial positions, including most recently as the curator of American art at the Portland Museum of Art in Maine, where she oversaw the museum's collection of over 11,000 American paintings, sculpture, and decorative arts. Diana also spearheaded the multi-stage reinterpretation of the Winslow Homer Studio, and her recent ex ex exhibitions include Myth Makers, the Art of Winslow Homer and Frederick Remington in 2020, and In the Vanguard, Haystack Mountain School of Crafts, 1950 to 1969, which was on view in 2018. Now, before turning things over to Diana, who will serve as our moderator, I want to say a quick word about the program format itself. The program is being recorded and will be made available online afterwards at the Colby College Museum of Arts YouTube channel. If you need closed captioning, there is a live transcript feature at the bottom of your screen that you can enable. Also, the conversation among our panelists will last for about 45 minutes, but we have reserved about 15 minutes for questions from the audience. So please feel free to share your comments and inquiries in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Lastly, before we begin, I, would want, I want to thank the Lunder Foundation, without which this program would not be possible. 
It is through their generosity that the Lunder Consortium for Whistler Studies was founded in 2010 with the aim of fostering and disseminating original scholarship and critical analysis of James McNeil Whistler and his international artistic circles through conservation studies, exhibitions, publications, and symposia. Without further delay, I will turn things over to Diana and our panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elisa. I'm going to start sharing my screen. And take a moment as well to echo my sincere thanks to the Lunders for their very generous support of this project and so many others related to James McNeil Whistler across our field. I'm really excited to be here to have the opportunity to think about Whistler's approach to urban change and how we can apply some of the lessons that he learned in 19th century Europe to these two seemingly very disparate spaces, Waterville and Washington, DC. Both of these spaces, although they seem quite different, are grappling with evolutions in industry, culture, and population similar to those that Whistler observed in his own time. And this panel is coming together today to really ask those questions about what we can learn about our own cities from thinking about how Whistler understood his. And to help us answer this, uh, Ben Lyle from Colby studying the evolution of Waterville and Scott Kratz, who is knee deep in um, his own bridge evolution project, I think are gonna be ideal conversation um, conversationalists with our Whistler expert, uh, David. So I want to take a quick moment and ask first Ben and then Scott to introduce their respective projects in relationship to Waterville and to Washington, D.C., and then I will jump in with an introductory question for David. Yeah, so uh, it's great to be here. Um, I, I know that... Um, Whistler is the is the primary draw. So, but uh, uh, not everyone probably knows a whole lot about Waterville, if anything. So, just a real quick kind of two or three minute um, intro to the city that will help uh, maybe make some of the, my later comments uh, make a little more sense. Um, Waterville is located in central Maine on the Kennebec River, as many of the images will show. Um, as Elisa said, this is Wabanaki land. Um, English colonists settled there in the uh, permanently in the 1760s after the construction of a fort across the river, and the town was incorporated in 1802. So um, jumping forward to today, there's a, just under 17,000 residents, about 91% white non-Hispanic. Uh, the median household income is about two-thirds of the national median, and 25% uh, of the population lives um, below the poverty line, which is twice the national average. Um, now, this this image we're looking at here, I, I chose partially because it's from the period when Whistler is uh, working, um, the 1870, this bird's eye view right here. Um, you know, you, you see this sort of the early formation of an industrial waterville with a bump out there in the river at the bottom, um, the Lockwood Company, which we'll, we'll revisit again. And then upriver would be where Colby College was, which is also featured in the inset. Um, in the uh, and I should note that in the 40s and 50s, to kind of get away from the from urban cramping and uh, the railroad, the college moved to those hills uh, to the west that we can see there, um, where it remains. Um, over time, you know, the city would increasingly industrialize. It would become a railroad hub for Central Maine and a service center for the surrounding area. Uh, before deindustrialization starts to hurt, starts to hit, uh, really in the 1950s. Um, impacting cotton textiles in particular. So if we go to the next image, we're jumping forward about um, one century. Um, and with a different perspective, we're looking north now along the river. You'll see that same plant down th that I mentioned in the last image at the bottom. Um, I show this image that, to set up some of the later comments on, on urban change here. Um, Main Street runs basically north, not the road right next along the river, but the one to the left that is a bit more diagonal. You can see the buildings hugging Main Street. Um, to the left of that is a large parking lot shopping center that's called the Concourse. That is the first urban renewal project in the 1960s in Waterville that dramatically transformed the town. On the river, you'll see to the right of Main, uh, Main Street, you'll see the Head of Falls neighborhood, which was about to be uh, erased from the landscape uh, at this time in 1972 as the second uh, urban renewal project uh, in 
in the city. Um, urban renewal doesn't really stem the the kind of slow industrial uh, economic decline that that occurs really through the early two thousands. Uh, in 2014, Colby College um, got a new president who was very committed to kind of uh, reinvesting um, in downtown, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. This is, you know, a lot of people are very uh, excited about this, given the economic conditions of the city. And, and there's also some pushback and concerns about the uh, college's overreach. Um, but like any urban place, we really see a lot of economic stratification in the city right now as it kind of grapples um, with with the industrialization and how to position itself going forward. And good. I invite Scott. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Diana, for this invitation. Um, so my name is Scott Kratz. I'm I, for the last twelve years. It's been my honor to lead um, the this new civic space in Washington D.C., the Eleventh Street Bridge Park. Um, and when people think about rivers in Washington, D.C., they often think about the Potomac, but actually we have two rivers. One of the reasons why we were founded as the nation's capital, the Potomac and the eastern branch of the Potomac that we now know as the Anacostia River. Um, the, it's the place where <clears throat> some of the, we're not really an industrial city, but where um, the majority of our industry did happen here in the nation's capital along the Navy Yard, um, built uh, number was the primary shipbuilder, um, the armaments, um, the for hundreds of years is the oldest U.S. Navy base in the United States. Well, D.C. and Philadelphia sort of battled that out plus or minus a year. But um, the and um, <clears throat> rivers um, like the Anacostia River, and in our case, not one but two freeways have divided the city for generations. Um, the It's divided the city by race. Um, on the west side of the river in Capitol Hill and the booming area of Navy Yard. Um, it's a very mixed area, but majority white. Uh, east of the river is in Anacostia and Fairlawn is 92% African-American, um, an enormous divide in um, property values, in unemployment, uh, child poverty. There's a 14.7 year life expectancy difference between the um, black men and white men um, the, in the District of Columbia and uh, 81 times difference between the average household wealth of black families and white families in DC. So this huge divide. And in our case, we had this uh, sort of once in a lifetime opportunity when these old freeway bridges that crossed over the Anacostia River were, reached the end of their lifespan, these bridges that were built in the 1960s, um, to instead of getting rid of all the old infrastructure, could we extend that initial federal investment um, and transform part of the old bridge, the old piers and pilings, into a new park, into a bridge park, but um, and one that no longer holds cars or tractor trailers, but that holds community-driven programming spaces. Um, so we're now at um, a, it's been informed by over a thousand meetings with the community, putting this decision-making power back into the hands of local residents is a um, key goal. Um, and um, as well as, and we'll talk about this more later on in the conversation, but ensuring that in a time of great change, just like during Whistler's London, um, the that um, the local residents can stay and thrive in place has been a key part of the project. Um, but we're now at a 100% design. We should be um, soliciting our general contractor later this year and breaking ground early next year and opening up in 2026. So look forward to the conversation to follow. Fabulous. That's some wonderful context as we dive into our conversation. David, I'm going to ask you to describe a little bit of that profound change that Whistler was living through in late 19th century London, as well as the environs um, around Europe that he was visiting, such as Venice, Amsterdam, and Paris. And I'm going to ask you, too, to talk a little bit about the formal vocabulary that Whistler used to document these cities and those changes. Um, I'm curious as to what made Whistler's viewpoint unique, and also how he was considering his audiences as he was creating these works. Well, I suppose if you had to pick one descriptor for a person like Whistler, it was he was a showman. He understood his audiences, plural. He understood that um, serious social change was happening all around him uh, in Europe and in England. He also understood uh, issues like 
uh, urban change in Britain was driven by property values. Urban change in Paris was driven by the Second Empire with overarching uh, abilities to, to cause that change. He kind of uh, segued back and forth and round and round with this material, but his main purpose was the revolution he wanted to promote was an aesthetic one. And you see that in this picture at the Freer, it is the balcony. It's a picture he worked on for a decade. Um, and in that decade, he began to absorb ideas he'd learned, for example, from uh, Japanese prints, uh, as empathizing aesthetics. But key here is an industrialist buys his first big historical uh, painting, and it shows us the power of money to uh, support art. So on the far side, you see Battersea with the factories the slag heaps and so forth that were a mark of Britain's industry. These are, of course, the underpinnings of the social change and the collecting and celebration of fine art uh, that dominated uh, the Victorian period and, and comes into our own time. Um, he really saw the rise of modern merchandising and ambitious uh, civic construction projects, and they demolished landmarks and displaced the poor on both sides of the English Channel from the mid-1850s until the early 20th century. Um, and what happened was because of spacious parks and avenues and buildings for affluent city dwellers, uh, historic districts were obliterated. Uh, they were torn down, the poor were squeezed into uh, ever more uh, tight conditions. And by the end of his work, he had kind of gained a somewhat unre undeserved reputation as a historic preservationist. Now, this picture is a beauty that's at Colby College, shows people on the embankments. The embankments uh, were wildly disruptive for a decade from 1864 to 74. But here, all is whoops, peaceful. If it comes back, it's gone away. Mm -hmm. uh, it's at the museum. You can't. Mm. Uh, he has reduced. Uh, a, a busy thoroughfare. Remember, the Thames was the busiest uh, street, if you will, in London for centuries. He's made it peaceful and calm. A single steamboat mid uh, picture on the right is all it is that it indicates the sort of the, the might of the British Empire, which was built on shipping and industry. And leaning casually and looking out are pedestrians on the new embankments. It's all very backed off and aesthetic and it, it's an invitation for you to look. That's a, a main uh, part of, of his delivery. Could we have the next group, please? Right, a lot of things went missing in London and Paris both. These are all London uh, bits that went away. On the left, way in the background of this uh, image of Billingsgate, which was a marketplace, you can see the arches of the old London Bridge not the first London Bridge, but the one that's now, I think it's somewhere in Arizona because it was demolished during Whistler's lifetime. In the middle is um, the Temple Bar that was a, a beautiful gate designed by Christopher Wren, which became uh, a real bottleneck in getting from the financial district to the royal part of London. And it wasn't just dismantled, it was commodified. It was taken down brick by brick and eventually sold, as it happens, to one of uh, Whistler's own patrons who uh, put it up as a folly in her garden in the country. On the right is the Adam and Eve, an old um, you know, roadhouse or bar house on the banks of the river. Uh, this one is done four years after the embankment had erased it. And he's actually using photographs to reconstruct this, this look backwards. And if you look really hard at the bottom middle foreground, you'll see a tiny figure that is, um, a mudlark, that's a scavenger trying to make a living by finding stuff that's washed up on the shores of the Thames. So he's one of the many urban poor that appear in very um, subtle ways, shall we say, in, in, in Whistler's work. They populate it, but they certainly don't dominate. Let's look at the next one. This is what, what we mean by a formula. Whistler was a really skilled watercolorist, a painter, an etcher, a lithographer, a pastelist. And, and what happens with, with the uh, shop fronts and streetscapes is he's busy with this for over half a century uh, in all those different places, as mentioned. So what happens is a formula that ties them together. He, he does things like he crops the sides and the top. 
he leaves empty backgrounds that, uh, among other things, give you no notion of the, the noise of the streets. Uh, he uses color to make it rhythmic and um, elegant. On the far right is, which one is that? Oh, the fish shop. Yeah, that, he's, he's looking at a shop near where he lived. And in the middle, you can see a fish monger slab. But in showing a picture like that, he doesn't tell you anything about the importance of fish as food for the poor, for example. The, the middle picture is related to um, a dime novel that came out at, uh, at about the same time. And if I can find it, I will read you what it said, uh, what, what that novelist had to say. Um, it's an East End neighborhood. For a long time, we thought it was Chelsea, but that, that's because of his subtlety and his, his um, compositions don't always tell you where, where he really is. But the East End neighborhood, it's a slum novel by George Giss Gissing, and it conjured working class Londoner, Londoners that were threatening political unit during increased labor, labor unrest in the 80s. Here's what, what Gissing said about Hoxton. A region of malodorous markets, factories, timber yards, grimy warehouses, alleys swarming with small trades and crafts, filthy courts and passages leading into pestilential gloom, everywhere toil in its most degrading forms, the thoroughfares thundering with high-laden wagons, the pavements trodden by working folk of the coarsest type, the corners lurking holes, showing destitution at its ugliness. But the critics, when they saw this picture, talked about it as airy and careless as the movements of a butterfly. The deal here is airy, yes, careless, not so much. He is manipulating what he's seeing to speak to that um, audience that he wishes to reach, which is middle and upper class Britons. And he kind of extends uh, Oscar Wilde's notion that lying and poetry are arts. He does it with painting. But do I have another? Or have I gotten through all mine? Uh, oh yes, here's okay. here's here's um, some pictures of the urban poor. Can you see the little tiny figure in the middle uh, on the left, the little court? That is a street sweeper. Whistler swept the um, entire foreground of this picture clean, so he's pushed it back. It's a distance, but that is a familiar um, figure in the cries of London. These were the the young people that tried to make a living by sweeping up all the horse droppings that got in the way of the quality when they were crossing the streets. That you have to look for something like that in his work. On the right is a rag shop. He loved rag and bone shops. Um, you will see those in uh, photographic histories of uh, people like Thompson with four page Ill, uh, uh, four page articles describing what's going on. All Whistler does is writes a little word rag on one of the windows. I don't know if you can make it out. The point is that he knew that his audience was aware of these things because they were in the popular press, they were in books, they were in uh, reform societies of various kinds. And uh, so what he did was he took advantage of the knowledge of his patrons to fuel uh, the background of the images that he made. Let's see. Do I have any of these things? Sorry. Uh, thank you so much, David. Um, ben, I'm going to turn to you and just ask whether what you're seeing in how Whistler depicts these questions around um, urban change and urban poor in London um, have some resonance with the past and present of New England hill, uh, mill towns like Waterville. Yeah, thanks. I mean, there's a lot to to dig into there um, and certainly like cities are constantly this side of you know tension between the old and new or the traditional and the modern um and and i would actually in in as i was reviewing the kind of exhibition catalog and some of david's points he, he just mentioned the second french second empire and how whistler arrived in in paris a couple of years after baron hausman's massive modernization project was started there where he plowed these grand boulevards through um, old uh, working class neighborhoods. Um, I, I, my mind jumped forward a little bit to that urban renewal period I referenced in, in my intro um, and that is depicted here in the 1960s or, or right before it. Um, you know, this, this was the federal slum clearance program. Um, and under this, uh, roughly one third of downtown was basically raised most of it uh, because it was working class, poor working class housing. 
Um, on the left here, we have an image from the city newspaper, the Morning Sentinel, uh, depicting uh, the area that's targeted for slum clearance. On the right, we have an aerial photo of basically the area that does get raised, that gets turned into the the concourse, as I as I that we saw earlier, uh, basically a big parking lot and strip mall. Um, you know this. Um, this photo was part of a series that, uh, this in which the Sentinel was kind of introducing urban renewal to voters. Um, they hadn't approved it yet. Um, and, you know, like most newspapers, the Sentinel was largely pro-development, pro-renewal, pro-growth. It helps their bottom line to have more money to advertisers and subscribers, of course. Um, but this this piece in particular, this image in the article it came with um, struck me as a little bit different. It's not quite as openly kind of boosterish because uh, it can't be. Um, and it's it's kind of capturing the experiences of some of the, the future displaced. Um, you know, I look at this image and, and I see some resonances with some of those that we just saw this sort of kind of ragged landscape. Um, it feels a little more cramped, perhaps, than some of the ones that, that Whistler were doing. Um, but, you know, the roof lines uneven, the stoops, uh, the street itself, uh, it feels cramped in a, in a kind of a publicly intimate way that I think uh, contrasts with post-World War II norms uh, around suburban domestic life and modern architecture and planning as that the, the other batch of images um, suggest. I, in general, I think what ultimately is happening, I mean, David David used the phrase in an invitation to look, um, I, which resonated with me. Uh, this seems like an invitation to look, but he also mentioned the ways that these images are cast for not for the people or not for the people being depicted, but for uh, up class, you know, pe people of, of more means. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think this image in, in, on the left in many ways pathologizes poverty and the, the kind of urban condition. This is designed for middle class viewers. Um, and those contrasts with, you know, this as, as a sort of artifact of the past uh, that, that is meant to encourage a desire to, to modernize. Um, but there's also a sort of, it's impossible to kind of enact these changes, I think, without also triggering sadness and nostalgia for particularly for very small communities like this. Um, one of the things in, in some of the pieces I saw, the Whistler pieces of these kind of, you know, disappearing streetscapes is there often seem to be many women and children in them. And in this photo, you know, there's a child on the stoop, there's a woman in a window. In the story that accompanies it, most of the interlocutors are women, uh, whether they be younger single mothers with lots of kids or elderly women that are limited, have limited mobility, and they're going to be displaced and, and they can't, they wouldn't be able to afford to have a car or walk to, you know, they, they lose access to their church, to their shops on main street, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, if we skip to the next image, we'll see what happens. Um, this to new modern landscape, right. That's designed to attract middle-class consumers um, in a way that the, you know, big department stores are invading London during Whistler's time. Um, but also crucially, we've removed signs of poverty and most primarily poor people themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, ironically, this is kind of forecasting a little bit, this, this, the current development in downtown Waterville in a lot of ways is just trying to undo a lot of the kind of violence of urban renewal, which has happened in a lot of cities, right? Trying to reconstruct a sort of earlier version of the city that is walkable scale where there's public life on the streets. Um, and it's somewhat idiosyncratic though. How do you design idiosyncrasy, right? Um, but I, I'll get to that <laughs> in a little bit later. Uh, thank you. This is fabulous. Um, Scott, I'm going to pose a similar question to you with your work in Southeast Washington uh, and ask if how how the district is facing questions a century later that Whistler can help us connect with and seek answers to. Yeah, I um, I mean, cities are are never wrapped in amber. They always go through change. They always go through. Uh, I'm just I'm really struck by um, Ben's comment of the sort of violence of urban renewal, which um, certainly was the case sort of here in D.C. Um, the when we have these urban renewal projects, often we ask two questions: sort of who is this for, and who's going to benefit. Right. And oftentimes, um, if not exclusively, it's people of color and those with low economic means are the ones that um, 
they're, it's not for them and they certainly don't benefit. In the 1950s, we had a uh, significant urban renewal um, here in Washington, DC um, that pushed out a little over 11,000 uh, African-American um, families from Southwest, pushed them in across the river, across the Anacostia River into Southeast DC. Um, I will note that the Smithsonian's Anacostia Community Museum has a really wonderful, um, the online um, piece that captures some of those stories called Beyond the Bulldozers that's fabulous. Um, if you're in DC, it's all geocoded. Um, the, it's, it's really amazing. Um, but <clears throat> we're fast forward to today, or at least the last like 10, 12, 15 years, uh, Washington, D.C., after hemorrhaging population for generations, um, went in a strikingly different direction, where we've gained over 100,000 residents in the last 12, 13, 14 years, um, which is significant. We've gone from 650,000 residents to a little more than 750,000 residents. Um, and we've seen neighborhoods that normally change in a generation or two change seemingly overnight. Um, many of those 100,000 residents um, the, have come down to uh, the um, near the Washington Navy Yard, which you see on sort of um, picture to your right. Um, it's a booming development now. There's still U.S. Navy still has a presence there, but it's the fastest growing area in Washington, D.C. And you feel like that sort of presence is just sort of perched on the river um, the, and just about to sort of jump over the river. Um, we've had not only the displacement um, the, from that urban renewal, but we've also had a legacy similarly, um, sounds like up in Maine, um, of uh, freeways um, the, and other infrastructure that, that have blasted through communities of color. In our case, um, the, the 295 freeway uh, on the east side of the river um, blasted through a historic neighborhood, um, the, um, one of the first African-American neighborhoods in Washington, D.C., known as Berry Farms. Um, the that displaced um, the hundreds and hundreds of, of African American families. So I think one of the sort of key questions for the bridge park is, you know, when when we're looking in the next five years, east of the river is about to see over a billion dollars of economic development coming in. That's a billion dollars of economic development that's coming east of the river in the next five years. How do you invest in a traditionally underinvested uh, neighborhood without displacing the same residents we're trying to serve? Um, and that's become a key part of the Bridge Park's um, effort um, the, of investing not only in the bricks and mortar of this park, but investing um, uh, to make sure that the thousands, tens of thousands of residents who helped shape this park from the beginning can be the ones that benefit from it. Uh, fabulous. I'm, um, I'm going to turn us actually to that that river itself that we see so um, so central to this image that Scott has up. and ask David to talk a little bit about the role of, of bridges and this embankment project that you mentioned, David, in 19th century London. Um, these are major evolutions um, and they've profoundly disrupted the nature of, um, of urban life in London. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd love you to talk a little bit about how these construction projects wrought that change. Um, and again, what Whistler is being selective about when he's visualizing these bridges the change undergoing that they're undergoing, um, as well as those embankment projects. Okay, it came as quite a surprise to us in in our researches for this project that fifteen bridges were built across the Thames during Whistler's tenure in England and France from the eighteen fifties to his death. Um, previously, London Bridge at one end and a bridge you know, way up at Hampton Court had been all there is. Um, they were often wooden bridges. Um, the technology of um, of steel, uh, cable, that kind of thing changed it. We walked yesterday over the Penny Bridge, the beautiful little Penny Bridge, two Penny Bridge. Yeah, the price went up, sorry, two Penny Bridge. Um, bridges like that did exist and they were uh, taking advantage of manufacturing techniques and so forth. But what Whistler is doing here, he's, these are confrontational, low-life pictures. This is early on in his, his London career. And let me just read you what the press had to say about these. These were not folks that you'd have over for drinks, okay? Um, so uh, it's about economically driven urban change. And the reporter said, such etchings of this queer longshore reach are all the more precious because the beauties they perpetuate are dying out. What with embankments and improvements and increased value of river frontage. And the article ended by assuring readers that Whistler's portfolio will be a very good investment. 
So I think one of the things that is not possible for arts then or now is to sidestep the presence of the marketplace as a driver, the presence of the patronage as an audience. And those things I think carry on for centuries. Um, and it, the audience may be different, but there is definitely an audience and it is definitely linked to the market. So let's see, you know, the other one that I have uh, here's here's an, another way that he abstracts it. Whistler would push the, the image of the bridge to the background. He would distance it with a lot of water. He would, in this case, he's made it into a Japanese image, almost this beautiful pastel. It might interest you to know that his father was a major engineer who built bridges for the Tsar in Russia. So it's not like Whistler didn't know about the engineering of bridges. It had more to do with his... Um, distancing for the purpose of making art, not a report about bridges. So something like this, which is heavily indebted to uh, to Asian art, uh, is, a, is a very good example. Um, it was a rickety structure. It was only two, one of two wooden bridges left over the Thames by the time he got going. And it too eventually disappeared, you know, and was remembered only in works of art. Now, here's one that surprised me, this next one. Um, you can't see it, and that's sort of the point. In fact, it was so hard to see that we printed it upside down when we published the Whistler book in 1984, and nobody saw it except the critic in the Times. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, Whistler's always got a way to get you. But this bridge is, uh, what's it called? It was called, uh, crumbs, I can't see my own writing. Um, it was called the Old Chelsea Bridge, but it didn't start off that way. It was called the Victoria Bridge. It was put up by the Metropolitan Improvement Commission. It was high tech, massive chains and so forth, but it was declared unsound within four years of its construction. So, so kind of shady moments in construction are nothing new to, to our time. Um, when it was renamed Old Chelsea Bridge, Whistler uh, thought, well, I'll call this Nocturne, Silver and Opal, Chelsea. So we aren't even sure which bridge it is if we don't do our homework. But what he is doing coyly here is sidestepping the issue of a bridge that could make Queen Victoria look bad and instead choosing a palette and a title that celebrate her love of opals as a gemstone. And that is the kind of thing that tells us how he is operating within the context of massive and really fairly scary, scary uh, urban chains to basically create images of great beauty that outlast the details of the urban change specifically, but I think talk to us very strongly over the time about the links between art and, and change. I love that notion of, of distancing Victoria from this. Uh, well, yeah, she was she was quite a, a piece of work herself, you know, but they they did very much um were enthusiastic in, in the middle and upper, upper class circles about the power of their economy. And it's and of course it was in great competition with um with uh, other European powers. And so so uh, the honorifics of, of having a bridge named after you'd have to be careful about that if the darn thing fell down. <laughs> um Scott, you know more about bridges than I think anyone I've had the pleasure of being in conversation with. And I'd love you to speak a little bit about, you, you began to kind of touch on it, but that that role of the bridge and of the 11th Street Bridge as a physical connector, but also as metaphor in the context of your project. Yeah, I've turned into uh, quite the bridge geek. Uh, I drag, whenever I'm on vacation, I drag my poor wife to bridges um, all over the country uh, internationally. Um, the um, And in our case, in Washington, D.C., um, you know, we have this river and these two freeways that have long divided um, the, really split um, the nation's capital. And so, um, and for a long time, we've had rather, uh, relatively unattractive, I don't think anybody would argue with this, um, bridges that connected both sides but but um 
the but not many. Um, the there's there was the South Capitol Bridge, the 11th Street Bridge, um, the the Pennsylvania Avenue Bridge. All the really pretty bridges are um, not surprise. Um, the that uh, are west of the river. Um, uh, the or in the western edge of D.C. like the Memorial Bridge. Um, the that can that reconnected the country. Um, the after the Civil War. Um, the to the Duke Ellington Bridge over Rock Creek. Um, the beautiful Arch Bridge. Um, so. When we were looking at, you know, how do we recognizing that the city was really divided by these freeways and rivers and the um, how do we make oftentimes um, the when change comes to a community, it happens to the community, not with the community or for the community. So um, for us, it was really critical to make sure that local residents were really driving this change. And as much as we could, we were putting decision-making power back in the hands of local residents. So before we engaged a single architect or landscape architect for the park, we spent over two years, over 200 meetings on the just talking to local residents saying, what do you think about this idea to make a bridge park and um, physically and metaphorically connect both sides of the river? And while there was some skepticism to be sure, because um, there's an enormous trust deficit um, the, in the communities along the river, um, folks were interested to seeing this play out. And so we said, all right, well then help us shape it. So we had over, we've had over a thousand meetings so far to date um, the, to drive every single programming element that will be on this park. Um, so things like programming areas like a, a amphitheater, um, an environmental education center, public art that will tell that amplifies the voices of local residents, um, the uh, play space, urban agriculture for a community that has one grocery store serving 75,000 residents, a huge food justice issue. Um, and we, we took all these ideas and, and we baked it into a larger design competition and most many design competitions you know, the designers have no connection to the client, me, um, more or less the community, and that didn't make any sense to us. So we convened a group of about three dozen local stakeholders um, the to participate in the design competition. Um, and they met with each of the four final design teams multiple times. And over uh, after an eight month design competition that brought together 81 different design teams from or firms from across actually internationally, um, the the community, this group of stakeholders, uh, selected the design. So you can go to the next image. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, and the I didn't get to vote. The community voted. Um, the and their vote was for uh, this amazing design um, of this double decked park. These two trusses that come together and meet, sort of right in the middle, that makes way for all the programmatic elements. Um, the for um, that the community requested. Um, the architecture firm is Office of Metropolitan Architecture, or OMA, um, working out of the office in New York. Uh, and the landscape architect is Olin, um, the working uh, out of Philadelphia, but has done here in DC, the um, um, sculpture garden, um, the National Sculpture Garden, um, the redid the grounds of the Washington Monument, Canal Park, and a number of other elements. And they've really seamlessly taken these community requested spaces um, the, and uh, populated them. Thank you. Um, ben Waterville, of course, has water in its name. So I'd love to hear a little bit about how that city relied on that waterway originally and also how it's attempting to renegotiate its relationship to it in a context where it's not necessarily uh, expressly tied to industry. Yeah, um, well, I'll, I'll keep this short and I, uh, hopefully the images um, speak to some of those major changes, right? Um, of course, the, the river meant power um, and that powered these uh, often textile mills. Uh, the two images on the left, um, we, we see those bridges. Um, this is looking north along the river and a, a paper plant on the up at the top of the image on the Winslow side, which is the town across the river. Uh, and then the West Bank uh, looking north with the head of Falls neighborhood and a, and a uh, woolen uh, textile mill. Um, you know, over time, again, these these decline, the, the mills gradually shut down or relocated. Um, and, you know, this this is in keeping with uh, post-industrial development in, in most cities. Right. Um, industry was located in really prime areas in the center city. Uh, and when it relocated, it vacated all this excellent real estate um, and um you know, we see some of the kind of result over on the right. Now, the 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 second image is uh, looking downriver, so so south, 
Um, but that green stretch right there, it's head of falls, uh, where the factory used to be, uh, was redeveloped as, I mean, it was basically it was a snow dump and a, and a unpaid parking lot for, for decades before it was redeveloped in 2018, uh, as Riverwalk. um, further down the river, uh, you can see again, that Lockwood, um, past the two penny bridge that David was on yesterday. We can see the Lockwood factory, which uh, is one of the, the old textile mills that shut down and was re one of the mills was redeveloped as loft apartments and commercial space in 2009, which of course we're all kind of familiar with that. Um, you know, the, the kind of the loft apartment style, these sort of cobblestone commercial districts, these kind of new, uh, uh, niche industrial uh outfits that step into these spaces i i am particularly interested in craft breweries um and their relationship to urban change um or or cultural things like like artist studios or outdoor amenities like trail uh, you know rails converted to, to trails um and in this also culturally comes at a time when a sort of industrial authenticity becomes more more valued um, socially, right? And I think we're still very much in that moment. Um, in Waterville, I'd say that these developments lag a little bit than places like DC probably, um, right? Um, due to its location and size, um, but it's been getting more attention recently and certainly the college's investments there. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if the river became more of a focal point once this development downtown, if it if it hits, you know, that's very recent, uh, particularly the French Canadian neighborhood of the South End, which is past Lockwood on the river here, um, seems like it would be um, very desirable um, space, and but though I know there are concerns around gentrification there, and in a very active community that's that's very concerned about that as well. Uh, thank you. I'm I'm excited to learn more about the role of breweries, <laughs> um, <laughs> David. And in the last, I, I want to pose one quick last question to our panelists and encourage our audiences to share questions that you have for the panelists in our Q and A. Um, and David, you've you've coined the term art washing to describe the work that Whistler is doing um, and his ability to gloss over those harsher realities in order to create these just aesthetically gorgeous images for us. So um, I would love you to speak just a little bit more about that phenomenon. And then I'll ask Ben and Scott as well to really consider the role, if any, of artists and cultural spheres in their respective projects and talk a little bit about how, um, as Ben, you just mentioned, those kind of artists can serve as, as pioneers or um, as real kind of key contributors to these types of renewal projects. Well, art washing is actually a term that was coined in the 1970s, probably a journalist. Um, its implications go back to the Roman Empire or more, you know, because the service of art to place an agenda, to share an agenda is, is established in many cultures over centuries. With Whistler, he is uh, determined to uh, uh, change the attitude of what was an acceptable uh, subject and treatment uh, in then the Vic, basically the Victorian art establishment. He is, of course, one of the fathers of the abstraction of the 20th century. And in doing this, he chose these uh, urban topics, the streetscapes and the shops and the rivers and so forth, to advance that aesthetic agenda. This one, again, is one of the more Japanese ones. We're on the embankment, dur embankment during its construction, uh, this is 1872, this painting, the embankment was finished, I think two years later. But what he's done in the middle of the, of the uh, image is there's that kind of dark gray mass, it's a zigzag shape. He's reduced the kind of hoardings or screenings that you would see in great and grisly detail in the London Illustrated News at these building sites. He's turned that into an elegant Japanese screen behind it closest to us in again, fairly empty foreground. Uh, elegant figures are, are walking along. And then in the background, of course, the river, the, the power, House of, of the uh, British economy is, is uh, shown. Let's do the next one too, because I know we don't have much time. This, 
uh, the pass out. This here, now we're in Venice. Uh, this happens just before the streetscapes in London and Paris take off with a vengeance. Um, what's happening here is he's he's exploiting notions of the picturesque. There was a huge market for Venetian imagery in Victorian times, but he saw it kind of differently. He's abstracting it. These are the these are poor people. They're bead stringers and lace makers. He's pushed them back. He's ge ge geometric. How do I say? He's made the um, whole treatment ge geometric. Is what I'm trying to say. Beautiful bits of color and so forth. But they are the urban poor turned into works of art. And let's look at the last one. Um, one of his most beautiful late watercolors. What you see is a shop window. You see works of art in that window. He is acknowledging that he understands works of art like fruits and vegetables to be commodities for sale. And the eager little children are clustered and looking at that except for one little kid on the left. And she is looking, I don't know if you can make it out on your screens, but that's a sign for stewed eels, which was one of the foods of the poor. He's got the little children are in the streets because they didn't have anywhere else to go. But, but this kind of beauty um, distances or anesthetizes the threat of a hungry urban poor for um, the uh, art audience that's seeing it. So in all of these, um, images, what he does is he advances and, and works with an approach to imagery that we will see over and over in uh, the art of the 20th century. Think of the Ashcan School in New York, for example. But it also tells us uh, in an era where there's an awful lot of emphasis on contemporary art making, that it's not a bad idea to look at some of these old so-called masters to think about some of the same issues that resonate over time. Want to jump in, Dana? Oh, I was gonna just let you. I was gonna let you roll. Yeah, yeah. So, um, the uh, so <clears throat> a little context for this. Um, you know, I, I mentioned the um, deep and and very real concerns of gentrification and displacement that's happening in D.C. So back in you know we we're out there talking to the community about what kind of programming should be on the park. We heard all these great programming ideas that we baked into the design competition, but we heard a much deeper need for housing for workforce, jobs, um, the uh, preservation of Black-owned businesses. So back we in 2015, we realized this was a real, real opportunity to not only build the bridge, but also invest in nearby neighborhoods to make sure that we can try and get ahead of issues of displacement and gentrification. So we spent a year um, building out strategies in uh, affordable housing, um, the workforce training, preservation of local businesses, supporting entrepreneurs, um, and we launched our first, what we called our equitable development plan in 2016, uh, late 2015, excuse me. Um, and we've been investing in, um, we've started up a community land trust, running home buyers clubs, investing in um, businesses nearby through low cost loans, technical assistance. We've seen 150 East of the River residents be trained and employed in construction jobs well in advance of the park breaking ground, right? To make sure these, the park benefits nearby um, residents. But one of the things that we we made a mistake is that um, the you know we could get this workforce, we could get the housing, we could get the small businesses, and we've invested over eighty six million dollars to date in these local in these strategies. But if we lose what makes the neighborhood the neighborhood, right? Um, the if we lose the sort of arts and culture um, the that are there, that has enormous downstream consequences. So. We spent a year working with arts and culture leaders and, and created a whole series of arts and culture strategies. And one of those was making sure that the park itself um, the um, had community driven art that, you know, often um, there's talk of place making, but um, the role of artists and cultural leaders is about place keeping, right? How do we make sure that in a very real and authentic way, um, the that local residents are telling the rich histories and, and stories of the neighborhood and, and amplifying those local voices. So last year we spent a year on the uh, creating a, a local stakeholder driven curatorial committee. We did a big call for public art for the park. Um, and these are some of the artworks um, the, that have been selected. Um, the uh, big murals, 
um, sculptural installations, um, the uh, a hammock grove um, that'll be part of the park. That's going to be really spectacular. Each one of the hammocks is going to be is going to honor a different community leader on both sides of the river. Um, all women that were selected that wasn't part of the plan, but I think it's just sort of something that's interesting. Um, and uh, the and and making sure that we're incorporating this art sort of into the um, park, not as sort of plop art, but sort of deeply integrated into that design to make sure that. The voices that um, are going to be there will remain. And finally, um, it's not just uh, vision; it's not just visual art. On the, you know, we're going to have a 250-person outdoor amphitheater. So we're, we've been collaborating um, with the local GoGo -Go Museum that's just going to open up soon. GoGo -Go is the official state music, um, the Washington D.C. Um, and uh, and and that's an opportunity to have an ongoing um, continued exploration of the horses, arts, uh, rich history and culture um, the of Washington, DC. Can I just throw in something that stimulated from your just comments, Scott? And that is that some of these displaced people that we see tiny images of in Whistler's um, images, there was a whole movement by the turn of the 20th century for um, these stories to appear on the music hall stage. Performers, some of them were um, uh, from the slums and so forth. So this this is kind of repeating. I, when I when I hear about hip hop, I often think about about music halls and what kind of songs were being sung and who was writing them a century before that. Fascinating. Um, I, uh, ben has gamely offered to forego his last slide, so we have an opportunity to get our audience questions. So I'm going to stop sharing and uh, allow Lisa to summarize one or two of the questions that the audience has for this uh, August group. That was a really wonderful conversation. Thanks so much to everybody for really bringing to light a lot of contemporary but also historical issues. Um, one of the questions, I'll sort of combine the two and it, it can be directed to Scott and Ben and I'll sort of toss in a little bit of, of my question in there as well. Um, one person was asking specifically about Waterville planning and if there was anything, any considerations about retaining buildings or apartments for civic use and the like rather than sort of raising the ground and building something from the ground up. And then another question that was asking about any examples where you see the displacement of poor and working class people averted through proactive housing policies, both in Waterville, but also in Washington, D.C. So I wondered if maybe you both could speak to where the old is made new again and where you sort of see the benefit of not taking that approach. Um, I know oftentimes when you see renderings for these projects, there is a lot of that sort of aesthetics that come into play where you're sort of doing a projection of how people can visualize the space. So you do lose a little bit of that reality in those renderings, but it's very much grounded in real issues. So how do you negotiate that? Uh, I, I can, I can speak to, uh, well, certainly, uh, in Waterville, the, the, um, you know, when, when this urban renewal is going on, I mean, a lot of this is very old housing, so it's, it's, um, probably not necessarily salvageable. Um, the call the old college location, they just knocked down and that would have been even earlier than urban renewal. Um, those buildings would be incredibly valuable right now if they'd have if they'd have kept them um around um and you know i think we see some of that in the um the redevelopment of these uh old factory spaces uh the lockwood in particular um although even then i mean it is uh, it, it in a place like waterville i think it's a challenge to get that kind of investment capital in there um as evidenced by a series of kind of you know half starts on the on the second mill building that uh, haven't quite been realized um in terms of the i mean proactive housing policies i don't know i i know that waterville is increasingly experiencing a housing crisis uh, i'm not aware of any particularly proactive housing strategies there i can't think of ones in particular i mean of course artists have long been uh key uh players in, in anti-gentrification um activism um but you're also working in a context in which housing in which housing is commodified and private property rights are valued above just about any other right uh and i think that's a creates a kind of 
practically impossible situation, which, you know, makes Scott's work super interesting and how um, thoughtful and comprehensive, but also clearly how difficult it is to um, fight against um, these, uh, the, you know, the new development that, that is primarily interested in, in building for more affluent people. And I'm happy to share some of the, because we really start when we were starting our equitable development strategies back in 2015, we, we um, in my limited imagination, we were primarily focused on housing, but then we've since expanded it to these other strategies. But several of the affordable housing strategies that we've been implementing for the last six years, um, they are, you know, we've been running this uh, Ward 8 Home Buyers Club and, and providing down payment assistance, as well as covering closing costs. It's now seen 130 Ward 8 Board eight is east of the river. Board eight renters become homeowners, right? Capturing intergenerational wealth for a neighborhood where 75% of the residents are renters and at greatest risk of displacement. We've been leading tenant rights workshops, right? Because we're seeing a lot of predatory, particularly LLCs coming in um, and scooping up the smaller, like four to 20 unit apartment buildings that sort of fly under the radar. Um, and, you know, the, um, and we're seeing residents being offered, you know, hundred bucks, 200 bucks to sign here, sign here on this piece of paper that sounds great until you need to find a new place to live. And um, the and uh, knowing their rights is, is critical as well as building tenant associations. Mm -hmm. We stood up the Douglas Community Land Trust that now has over 250 units of permanently affordable housing. And we've been raising millions of dollars for property acquisition as part of that. So any one of these isn't like gonna solve it. It's gonna be all of these. And I think that sort of larger multi-sector approach um, is key and thinking about this work early intentionally and with the community at the center is is critically important because once the market really starts to move to development in you know the um, rehabbed historic buildings or you know fill in the blank um, the market's going to move much faster much faster than we or the government could respond to it um, I will say all of this work has been um, evaluated by a team from the Urban Institute a big uh, research team that's telling us what we're getting right what we're getting wrong. Um, and documenting this work because we're now, people are so hungry for answers or potential solutions that we're now advising nearly a dozen similar projects around the country about how do you invest in underinvested neighborhoods, you know, with, with um, and ensuring that local residents can continue to benefit from it. So um, it's exciting to see this work happen from coast to coast now. Thank you. And that actually, if, I know we're over time, but I'll just do one more question um, that sort of relates to what you were both talking about, which is the sort of movement in, in this field towards community input and impact and getting outside sort of focus groups is be part of the process to make sure that you're doing the right thing and accounting for enough of the community as possible. One of the questions that came in through the chat was um, just talking about Whistler's voice and his perspective in all of this. And I'm curious, um, to sort of build off of the question, which is, what did Whistler have to say about his portrayal of urban life, specifically as an artist? And I think I'm interested also, of course, Diana and, and David um, chime in first, but Scott and Ben, um, you both as, as non-art, non-Whistler, you know, people, I'm curious what your perspective is also on these, you know, drawings and paintings that, what do you see, what do you not see in them that was striking to you? So. Diana or David can start. I think he found a lifetime topic in this material, in the chaos of the cities and the time that he lived. His, his first rag and bone shop is in a spot that Second Empire Paris had, had missed today, the Rue Mouffetard. And his last one is painted just before uh, his death uh, in Paris, a, a junk shop. Uh, I think what happens for him is it's it's a means to advance his aesthetic agenda, but it's one that he knows is on everybody's mind, no matter what their persuasion was or their country, you know, all through Europe. Uh, the, the changes that happened to towns and cities were profound. When he when he couldn't find um really uh you know when streets and when things were erased uh, in Paris, he went out into the countryside to the to the more provincial towns to find similar topics. Um, when you line all of these up, um, because of his formula, uh, it's pretty hard to tell where they are, and he will not necessarily tell you. So I think he's he's very involved, but he's quite distanced. His his primary purpose is not to. 
record them, but perhaps to explore them. So social reform was not a part of it, you think? That's what he, I was Well, gonna... remember in that time, there was the activity of slumming. It was as, as well established a pastime for the upper classes as riding a bicycle or playing tennis. And so he, he believed in the power of the individual, particularly himself, was to, um, to record those people. He observed them and he put them in, but I don't think he, that wasn't his main agenda, I don't think, Alicia. But I think as the as the questioner notes, I mean, Whistler was was often um, certainly public about his pronouncements, but I think in in opposition to works, uh, David mentioned somebody like John Thompson, who is accompanying photography specifically with text that is meant to exacerbate this um, this notion of these communities being displaced. Whistler's really trying to toggle and make a balance in order to retain um, his his constituents. So um, I think his his written silence on this in in some respects has to do with with trying to maintain um, his his sponsorship. And I just chime in yeah. and say I, I think it's really fascinating on a um, seeing how these topics resonate to this day, right? On um, the for sure on um, the that. Um, investment, urban renewal, um, the displacement, gentrification, right, um, the has been happening for, for generations, for hundreds of years, right? I think our sort of challenge slash opportunity now is how do we fight through something that we see a lot of, of sort of a cynicism of, well, as soon as money comes in, um, the then that means someone's moving out, right? Um, the And I would argue that the residents east of the river <clears throat> deserve a waterfront just as nice as the residents in Georgetown, right? The thing is, how do you think about this in a different way, a different process, and, and be very intentional about this work um, to ensure that you know, they're the ones I go back to those first two questions I mentioned at the beginning of the program, like who is this, who who are these investments for and who's gonna benefit? Um, and and really loudly um answering those questions. Ben, do you have any thoughts? Uh <laughs> nothing too good. No I pressure. Imagine, but <laughs> but I I um Scott's question about who who is this for is, I think, always really, really important. And I think about that in terms of Waterville, too. Right? What are these new cultural institutions that are kind of revitalizing downtown? Like, like who are they for and how do we kind of, um, I don't know, think about that. When I look at these Whistler paintings, decontextualized, because I, I don't know how to read them because I'm not, a, I, don't, I don't know this period. Um, I, I do see a longing for a certain type of city that uh, we also tend to continually across time get rid of uh, and replace with something new and and flashy. And I think that, again, that sort of, I don't know, it, it returns to this phrase for me, the right to the city. Is there is there a right to the city? Is there a right to staying in place um, that uh, supersedes um, economic power? And that is clearly something that we've been breaking with for a very very long time and we'll continue I, to do so. I really love that you sort of we can end with that note because you I, to me what's always interesting is the way that Whistler has the right to move through the city and the parts of the city that he wishes to and then he can kind of retreat and do something else so it's it's also that's that artistic privilege that he enjoys which not everyone in the community has is something that's kind of like a subtext um, sort of within all of these images that are beautiful but complicated. So I love how all of that has kind of 